Hi, welcome to the CNECF Energy Data Lounge stream. And today I'll be speaking with uh, Florent and Florent from Society General. I am Aruba Karsitik Angu, CNCF ambassador. Florent and Florent will, will be sharing with us their cloud native journey at Society General. Now, the video has already been recorded for this session due to compliance reason. Uh, so we'll go ahead to play the video, then come back to answer any questions you have. Enjoy. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Welcome, Welcome to the CNCF End User Lounge, where we explore how cognitive technologies are adopted by end user organizations across different industries and sectors. The end user community is formed of more than 160 vendor neutral companies that use the open source software to deliver their product. I am Abubakar Siddiq Ango, a CNCF ambassador. And today with me, I have Laurent Fabius and Carl Floron as guest speakers. In this live stream, we bring end user members to showcase how their organization navigates the cloud native ecosystem to build and distribute their services and products. Join us every fourth Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Now, this is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such, it's subjected to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that will be in violation of the code of conduct. Basically, we are saying, please be respectful to all the fellow participants and presenters. If you have any questions for us, we will be monitoring them through the live stream. Make sure to ask your questions in the live chat. Now, this week we have Laurent Vabies and Ralph Laurent here with us to talk about the Cloud Native's journey at Societe General. And yeah, I've learned some French today. Very good. <laughs> Before we dive into the questions, Carl and uh, I forgot what I just learned. Lauren, um, Florian, can you briefly introduce yourself, please? <laughs> okay, I, I let you start, Florian. Okay, so mm -hmm. my name is uh, Florent Carré. I am a cloud uh, engineer at Société Générale. Um, so we are uh, one of the principal European uh, financial services group um, present in more than 50 countries. And uh, so I, I'm specifically um, in the future team in charge of uh, orchestrated containers, uh, the offer that uh, is mainly based on alternative products uh, today, uh, you know, infrastructure services. Okay. And uh, on my side, uh, Laurent Verbiez, so I am a service manager of uh, the, the Docker infrastructure, and I uh, manage uh, a small team in charge of the run operation on, on all the, our clusters. Uh, so uh, all the interaction with clients and uh, maintaining the cluster operational uh, every day. Yeah, awesome. Glad to hear uh, from you all with such great experiences. But first, let's start. Can you tell us more about the infrastructure set up at your company and what technical challenges do you currently face? Um, okay, um, so I can start and certainly uh, Laurent will add uh, some interesting points. Um, so we are quite an old company. Uh, we are a bank uh, that is uh, 157 years old. So um, it's a quite huge group. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are present in 61 uh, countries. I just checked. Um, and so we have um, a long uh, IT journey behind us and also, of course, in front of us. Uh, so um, as most companies, we have what we call traditional systems, uh, you know, with uh, um, physical servers, uh, mainframe, of course, physical network uh, data centers. Yeah. And we are, uh, for some years now, we are um, in a transformation journey. Uh, so we are going to, uh, to the cloud. We have a, an official target of 80% uh, of workload uh, in cloud. Um, and we have a, a hybrid cloud strategy. So uh, by hybrid, I mean um, that 
we uh, we use a public cloud and also a private cloud oh, nice. and uh, so to, so Laurent and I we are more focused on the private part of the of the cloud uh, and uh, today we can share uh, about what we do uh, with uh, uh, containers uh, privately awesome you want to add something Laurent uh, no, I think um, <clears throat> uh, Florent covered it all. Uh, uh, just maybe a, a small uh, scale value. Uh, we are um, uh, hosted. We have uh, clusters in three regions: Amer, uh, Europe, and uh, Asia. Uh, okay, so we are we are doing uh, twenty four seven uh, uh, run on the on the clusters. And uh, we have uh, thousands now of uh, containers running in, in production. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and I know definitely uh, um, part of your strategy is using cloud native tools like Kubernetes and so on. If not, we won't be here. When did you start with Kubernetes and other cloud native technologies and why? The journey, I think, uh, started in 2017, if I'm, I'm correct, uh, with a very small uh, Kubernetes cluster, uh, not Kubernetes at, the, at this time, but Swarm cluster uh, with a Docker and, uh, and a Docker Enterprise. Uh, so it was a very, very small offer to, to, uh, to put a, a foot in, in the cloud world, in fact, and and then to propose to uh, to clients a new a new way to develop and to be more uh, agile on the development part and and, and be uh, uh, more focused on the time to market, help them to to deliver more quickly. That was yeah. the, the first step. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and. Um... What other technologies do you have in your stack or component aside uh, Kubernetes? Um, so uh, the core of uh, our current offer is based uh, on the Myrantis distribution. Uh, so as, man as Laurent mentioned, we started with Docker EE and uh, Myrantis about uh, Docker EE from Docker Inc. So now uh, uh, we are very happy to, to work with Myrantis. Uh, this is the core uh, of the, the stack uh, that we have. Um, uh, I would say that the underlying um, uh, solutions that we use uh, are pieces of uh, and services of our private cloud. So we have uh, uh, compute services, network services, security services, storage services. So the usual uh, services that you have uh, in a public cloud, but uh, in a Societe Generale flavor. Okay. Um, Part of it is based uh, on, uh, on cloud native uh, solution. I can mention uh, that we use uh, OpenStack, for example, uh, as a foundation for our compute. Um, and uh, um, uh, we also, in, in our, uh, in, so these are the foundations uh, and uh, in our own product, in, uh, we use um, uh, more and more cloud native products. Uh, we recently, introduce um, Prometheus uh, for some uh, uh, billing use cases internally. Uh, we needed some specific metrics for that. Uh, maybe we will talk a bit more about that if you're interested uh, later. Um, and uh, we have also introduced um, uh, OPA, OPA, uh, Open Policy Agent, uh, uh, also for, for the same uh, uh, use case. Uh, and of course, uh, after attending uh, KubeCon, uh, we have uh, many ideas. Uh, then uh, it's uh, the, for us, uh, we need to, to prioritize. That's maybe the, the, main, uh, the main challenge uh, when we see uh, the cloud native landscape and uh, all it offers. Yeah, also, I think you've led to the next questions I have had. Were you able to, okay, you said you were able to attend KubeCon, any or the previous EU? Uh, so uh, myself, I have attended uh, last year the, the European uh, okay. Kubecon online, uh, and this year the plan was to go to Los Angeles and and, and be uh, on site. But unfortunately, uh, it was not possible. So um, um, we attended uh, at very late in the evening, <laughs> uh, so, uh, to, so virtually, uh, and also uh, it was very nice to have. Uh, uh, the ability to see the replay uh, uh, during the day so that uh, you know 
<laughs> it was easier to to avoid the jet lag or kind of virtual yeah, exactly. jet lag, I would mm. say. I think for me personally, one part I love most was the fact that there's this thing where if you attend physically and a talk has passed, you can't rewatch it. But for the virtual or hybrid version, even if a talk just ended, you can just play it for yourself, which is which was exciting. So um what talks did you stood out to you during KubeCon and uh, the ones that are probably going, like you mentioned earlier, are going to influence a certain decision making within your organization? Um, personally, um, I, I was very impressed um, by the F uh, Fog Guru uh, demo uh, on multi cluster. I think multi cluster is a very hot topic for us at the moment. Okay. Uh, Maybe not for just now, but for, for the coming years, um, as we are in a hybrid cloud setup, uh, it's important for us to be able to, to move from one cloud to another cloud yeah. uh, with reversibility and also um, uh, to, to offer more and more um, bridges between a private cloud and public cloud so that uh, our end users are maybe our end users are more application owner they, that they are able to uh, um, take uh, advantages of uh, uh, the best of each world uh, we know that we, we cannot uh, compete in terms of catalog with public cloud yeah. uh, but we can offer uh, a very good uh, uh, security setup and uh, for some use cases uh, there are awesome tools in public cloud uh, that we cannot have uh, uh, in, in the private cloud or that are just for short period of time. And for these kind of use cases, it's uh, very uh, interesting for us to, to have multi-cloud and uh, be able to move uh, workload. And that was uh, the demo of uh, Fabu. Yeah, awesome. Um, Laurent, did you get a chance to watch uh, any? In fact, I, I watched some, not uh, as much as I, I wanted to, but uh, uh, I was mostly interested in all that um, uh, involve uh, security uh, topics okay. because it's a major topic for us. Uh, and also all the, the presentation around auto scaling okay. uh, because it is a, a big part of uh, what we will do next year, I think. Uh, try to uh, optimize our cluster, be more efficient, uh, reduce the uh, the number of, uh, of VMs on the cluster, all that part. It's very interesting. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so going back to Kubernetes, <laughs> I can imagine definitely the internal usage growth would definitely within your organization since you are now uh, scaling from using your monolith and your mainframes to going multi-cloud. It will have brought some challenges. How did you handle cluster growth and adoption of these technologies within your organization, given that you are now you are switching from a traditional way of doing things to a modern way of doing things? Let me put it that way. Uh, it's a complex topic, in fact, because uh, in our team, we only manage the infrastructure and not the development part of the application and so we try uh, a lot to uh, to to teach to uh, to share our knowledge of kubernetes because it's not uh, widely spread in the development teams for the moment and and they have a basic knowledge of kubernetes how that how it works what are the, the basic principles uh, but there is a big part of uh, teaching to do with them uh, and explaining what are the uh, the more complex part of Kubernetes, for example, uh, one that come to mind is um, uh, the function, uh, the, uh, the usage of uh, request limits uh, when you deploy on Kubernetes, it is something that is not natural to people coming from monolith application, mm -hmm. even if it can relate to uh, GVM uh, sizing, for example, but it's not really the same and they have more, uh, uh, it's complex for, uh, for them to understand this and to apply it uh, every day uh, on their development. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So um, in relation to that, you mentioned earlier that you, you have both private cloud and public. Can you tell us more about how you distribute workloads and if you rely on multi-tenant cluster deployments, what challenges do, does that bring? 
Um, so the decision, um, there, is, there are some decision trees uh, in different business units. Uh, they don't have all the same um, type of application. So depending on the application, it is eligible or not to the public cloud. Uh, because of course we have a huge focus uh, on data protection and in, in, in case of, uh, for example, customer data, we don't want to expose it. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, we have all the security in place to, to protect that data. Um, uh, and um, so this is regarding your first question regarding, uh, you know, public or private. And um, regarding um, uh, the kind of cluster that we have, we have a stretch cluster across um, multi uh, availability zone regarding uh, the private cloud. So we, we are able, um, if we lose one availability zone, to have uh, a zero downtime uh, on our application uh, based on that setup. Oh, awesome. awesome. Now, how do you manage cluster automation then? Upgrades, versioning, testing, and rolling out new features? Uh, so that's part of my team, um, uh, mainly, uh, even if we are uh, helped by the developers uh, uh, of uh, Florent's team. Uh, in fact, we uh, are working in, in cattle mode now uh, for the, the underlying host of the cluster. And uh, we renew every host uh, every two months. That is uh, our principle. Every two months, we renew the host with a new version of uh, operating system okay. with the updated uh, engine. And uh, once uh, every quarter, we upgrade the version of Mirantis uh, cluster. And this is done in place. We never create new clusters for the, the new version. Uh, so we, we do upgrade in place. Uh, most of the time, it's transparent for user. But there is a, a huge challenge. It's to uh, uh, work with developers to uh, anticipate uh, deprecated feature from Kubernetes. That is our biggest challenge uh, nowadays. It's, it's this one. Oh, OK, awesome. Yeah, now, now you just mentioned one of the biggest challenges you have. What other problems are you currently facing with running your clusters? The problems, uh, it's the multi-tenant part, it, in fact, for me, that is the, the, the biggest problem because um, uh, we provide the namespace as a service, in fact, in, in uh, Société Générale. It's not cluster as a service. So uh, yeah. many teams are using the same cluster. Okay. And one team doing uh, something wrong can impact the other team running on the same cluster. So, yeah. This is what we deal. Uh, we are every day. We have to, to to check what is running on the cluster. Challenge the team to uh, reduce their usage if uh, they are uh, over consuming uh, CPU or memory, and, yeah. and that is a big problem. Uh, oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, um, you wanted to add something? Uh, yes, well, regarding the CPU. Uh, and the quota and everything. I, I think this is a, um, for us a, a focus because uh, we are on premises. And uh, um, if our user requests more than what they need, actually they uh, artificially uh, increase uh, the size uh, of our infrastructure because behind, of course, there are physical uh, servers. Uh, yeah. And so for us, it's very important to keep a good balance between what is uh, necessary uh, for the good uh, work of the application yeah. and um, the cost and the uh, environmental uh, footprint uh, of uh, the infrastructure that uh, we provide. Yeah, OK. Awesome. So now let's talk about developer experience. You shared the other time how uh, you are trying to educate your developer team who don't have a lot of experience with Kubernetes on how to make use of it. Can you tell us more about what other developer experience uh, initiative you have that have played in the evolution of your clusters? Um, so part, part of the answer uh, is uh, about the, the way they can consume our services. Um, so as part of our uh, private cloud, we have uh, uh, APIs for all services. And so in my team, for example, we are in charge of uh, developing 
uh, the API for the Kubernetes uh, service. So it's not the uh, native Kubernetes API or the Myrantis uh, API. Uh, it's um, it's the API uh, that is uh, uh, for, that is following all uh, the private cloud uh, rules that we have uh, in terms of uh, security integration with the whole ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this API has the advantage for developers who have little knowledge about uh, Kubernetes. Uh, to uh, get a namespace uh, with a single uh, API call. So just a post on the API and you get your namespace. And you can also get uh, a full routing mesh uh, with a, a load balancer, a geographic uh, load balancing, uh, just with this single call, uh, depending on the uh, options that you choose uh, during this call. So this is a, a huge accelerator because uh, when you have the proper documentation, uh, getting up and running uh, only takes uh, a few minutes if you have uh, already uh, all the information that you need uh, to, to do this, uh, this post on the API. Um, awesome. So um, in line with that, uh, you've already told us how your developers interact with the clusters and the services. What is the typical life cycle of application development, maintainers, and troubleshooting? Uh, on that, we, yeah, we don't have a lot of information on, on that part because it's uh, it, it's managed by application team, and uh, we we I know that they are using uh, mostly Jenkins pipeline to 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 handle uh, to manage all this uh, lifecycle. Mm -hmm. uh, they are also uh, investigating uh, uh, Git actions and uh, Argo CD solutions. So. They, all this is uh, uh, ongoing, but we don't have a lot of details uh, about that uh, on our side. Oh, okay. Awesome. Actually, we want to be open uh, as we have many business units. There are different software factories with different uh, cultures, I would say. Yeah. And uh, depending on the type of workloads, they are free to, to use the, the, our service uh, as they would do uh, uh, on a public cloud provider uh, service, for example. Oh, okay. Yeah, also one yeah one one point we are uh, looking at at the moment is uh, to uh, uh, to provide some uh, operators to the clients so uh, classic uh, uh, standard products i would say a mongodb solution already packaged as uh, an operators that they could use uh, easily on their side on their names on, on their namespace okay yeah awesome so now uh, let's delve into your experience within the cloud native uh, community in general. Can you share with us what your experience is so far in the community and the cloud native space? Um, so my experience uh, is uh, mostly related to the KubeCon where uh, I was virtually. <laughs> um, and it was a, a great experience also uh, for the day-to-day -day job, uh, the quality of the documentation is very important, and the fact that we know uh, that everything is open, that we can, you know, go to the, the GitHub, interact uh, with the uh, contributors, uh, become contributors, uh, uh, maybe one day. This is uh, this is very interesting, uh, and for me, um, compared to you know the vendor world that uh, we were used to uh, for decades, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, really a, a huge improvement and a, a source of our motivation. Yeah, awesome. Now, what are future cloud native challenges at your organization? Is there any projects that you are interested in? Um, I mentioned the, the environmental impact of the infrastructure. Uh, I think this is for us um, uh, more and more uh, a concern. Um, so a company just uh, committed to be a carbon neutral in uh, 2050. And uh, so part of it is in on the banking side. So I will not talk about that because <laughs> I'm not directly involved uh, in selling yeah. our products. Mm -hmm. But regarding the IT, uh, we also have uh, our responsibility. We know that uh, uh, at the global level, um, year after year, uh, IT footprint is increasing. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's important for us to, to uh, 
to optimize the our footprint to reduce it when possible. And so um, there are some uh, cloud native initiatives uh, that are um, growing, I would say, in this area. Uh, some were addressed at the KubeCon, uh, for example, uh, uh, there were a presentation regarding uh, KEDA to to uh, to have auto scaling of pods. Uh, uh, also, the f well, we were talking about multi cluster. When you have multi cluster, uh, if you have the ability to easily move from one cluster to the other, you can choose also uh, to move the the, the workload uh, based on the footprint, for example, uh, the, the environmental footprint. So these are uh, areas where I think cloud native. Uh, uh, will bring more and more um, tools for us in the future. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Laurent, you, on your team, what challenges are you facing that you are looking at fixing with? Mm -hmm. Main challenges for us uh, is to automatize everything possible. And we want the cluster to be self-healing, to be self-regenerating, to be auto-scaling, to, uh, to reduce to the minimum what we have to do and be able to provide more value to the client by adding new feature and not having to, to deal with this day-to-day uh, -day, uh, incident uh, that are bringing nothing to the team, in fact. Yeah, sure. So um, the next KubeCon is in Valencia, Spain. Are you, are you all planning to attend physically? Since it's yeah, in probably. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if situation uh, permits it, yes, of course. Yeah. So awesome. So now, is there anything else that we've not covered in this interview that you probably want to share or you want to talk about your cloud journey? Oh, for me, it's okay. No, I just want to, to thank you for the, the opportunity to, to participate uh, to this uh, uh, live event. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to take questions uh, Mm -hmm. uh, in a few minutes, uh, if people have questions. Uh, thanks to CNCF for the, the, the job because it's a challenging uh, world and cloud world is a very challenging, very dynamic world. So it's very difficult to follow all the topics uh, every day and having a source, uh, a main source of information is, is very important. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much, Laurent and Florent. Um, I've learned quite the, a lot of things on this call, especially some French. <laughs> so thanks everyone for joining this latest episode of uh, the Cloud Native End User Lounge. It was great having uh, Laurent and Florent uh, talking about Societe General's usage of Cloud Native. We also really love the interaction and questions that the audience are going to be adding to this. So please ask any questions if you have for our audience. We will bring you the latest cloud native end user stories on, fourth, on the fourth Thursday of every month at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. So don't forget to join us at KubeCon Cloud Native Con EU in Valencia, Spain. It will definitely be hybrid again this time. So if you are unable to join physically, you can connect. Uh, it's to be happening May 17 to 20th of 2022. To, uh, to, you can come to hear about the latest technologies coming out of the Cloud Native community. It's like almost every day new technologies are coming on, more end users and more companies are contributing back to the community. So, and if you would like to showcase your usage of Cloud Native tools as an end user, you can join the end user community with more details on cncf.io slash end user. Thanks for joining us today and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome back, Ron. That was uh, an interesting video to watch again. <laughs> so uh, there have been quite a lot of interactions in the chat before we get to that. Is there anything else you would like to add or maybe some more things that have happened since we recorded the sessions? 
Um, yes, uh, the day-to-day -day job uh, is full of uh, adventures. Um, so Laurent and I and all the teams at Société Générale, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, welcoming more and more workload uh, every day because uh, the transformation to cloud native uh, is going on and, and it's quite a success. Um, so we are running uh, today uh, uh, more than uh, 1,000 nodes uh, uh, of Kubernetes clusters uh, with uh, uh, roughly uh, 30,000 pods. Um, so it represents um, hundreds of applications for, for the bank. Uh, and uh, what is very interesting for us um, uh, as infrastructure uh, people is that uh, um, we have a, a quite important diversity of applications. Uh, and so for that, uh, we try to uh, customize uh, the, the clusters that we provide. Uh, with uh, more and more security and more and more features. Um, so for example, uh, we are increasing the, the way we are doing the billing internally uh, so that people uh, are billed uh, just for the CPU and memory they consume or their requests. Uh, and uh, this is for, for the application owner, uh, but for the, the group as a whole, uh, a way to uh, uh, optimize uh, the way we use infrastructure because uh, uh, people are able to to, to save uh, compared to uh, what they were doing uh, on virtual machines, for example. And uh, with these uh, new improvements, uh, we think that uh, uh, projects will be able to save up to 30% of their uh, computer uh, compute billing uh, on our private cloud. So it's a uh, it's really uh, interesting. And uh, behind that, uh, there is a reduction of uh, energy that is consumed. And so it's also uh, for us a uh, contribution to a carbon neutral objectives that we have uh, for uh, 2050. Yeah, awesome. I think that leads to one of the questions uh, from the audience. What will be the next big challenge for Society General? Uh, well, the, the very, very big challenge is definitely uh, for me, uh, carbon neutral 2050, I think it's a world challenge. Uh, so no, it's not only a society general uh, challenge. Um, for us, um, uh, more uh, focused on our Kubernetes work, uh, we will be opening a new region in a few months. So that is a, a very interesting challenge. We already have um, Europe, uh, and uh, we have already two regions in Europe. We have one region in Asia, and so we will be uh, happy to open a new region uh, uh, in uh, America in a few months. Yeah, awesome. So um, uh, I think I also asked when we were recording the call, uh, one of the users is also asking, should we, should we be looking forward to you sharing more of your experience and use cases at KubeCon Valencia? Ah, we will be happy to do that. Uh, actually, uh, I know that you receive a, a lot of uh, proposals uh, of uh, call for paper. Uh, so uh, depending uh, on the competition, <laughs> maybe we will be able to to uh, you know present our work uh, in more detail. Um, we were happy to, to do that uh, last month uh, in the south of France uh, at a, a French event. And it was uh, very great uh, to share with uh, other companies uh, that are using uh, cloud native technology as well as universities also. And uh, so uh, for us, uh, it, it's part of, of the open community. Uh, CNCF is about open uh, services, uh, uh, cloud native, but there is also a lot of open source involved. Um, so uh, Société Générale uh, is also uh, uh, trying to uh, become an open source uh, contributor, but uh, it's not always uh, as easy as, as it could be. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we are already uh, out, um, opening source of uh, internal uh, application that we have. And uh, uh, maybe in the future, we will have more. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, you were talking about uh, uh, carbon neutral. We all have to play our part. <laughs> so it's not just a world problem. It's everybody's problem. Um, OK, Christian just came in. How easy or difficult was the move from Swarm to Kubernetes? 
Um, it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy for all application. It really depends, I think, on the teams. Uh, some teams, uh, some application uh, owner and their developers, they were able to migrate quite fast um, because they have the skills, because uh, they, they also can have that kind of priority in their backlog. Uh, other teams, they, this is for them a technical uh, story and they have more business story to tackle before doing migration. So for them, it will take more time. Um, in terms, I think, so this is a, a general answer. Uh, I think the, the difficulty is not technical. When you already have an application that is running uh, within containers, moving from uh, Swarm to Kubernetes is not that complicated. Uh, and also, uh, as we mentioned uh, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, we have uh, worked a lot uh, on the improving the developer experience. So uh, it's not difficult uh, for uh, our end user to uh, get a namespace instead of uh, Docker EE workspace uh, on Swarm. Uh, also, we have been uh, using the, the same line of products. We were with uh, uh, Docker Enterprise Edition uh, at the Swarm period. Uh, and um, so now uh, Marantis Kubernetes Engine, the Kubernetes distribution we use is uh, also provided uh, bundled with Swarm. And um, so there are tools for people if they want to migrate a Docker Compose to Kubernetes, for example, in the distribution. And um, we have also very good experts that have been with us uh, for a, a few years now, uh, since uh, nearly the beginning of the journey. So they, they have been working with the, uh, the applications to migrate to Swarm, and uh, they are helping also uh, the team to migrate uh, to, to Kubernetes uh, with a, a knowledge of uh, their previous uh, uh, challenges. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that is feasible. And currently, I don't, uh, I'm not aware of people who really want to stick on Swarm, for example, uh, Kubernetes is evolving, is be has become uh, uh, our standard. I think it has become also an industry standard. Yeah. So there is quite a lot of motivation from everybody uh, to, to, to migrate uh, to, to Kubernetes and uh, it's working quite well. Uh, our goal is to close uh, Swarm uh, in a few weeks now. Yeah, another question just came in. Why have you chosen to stay on an open source solution? Um, so, uh, not all the, of what we are doing is open source, uh, but it's important for us to have uh, Kubernetes as the core of, of uh, our orchestrating uh, offer, because we know the, the open source community uh, driven uh, by CNCF um, will provide us a value uh, release after release. Uh, and uh, we will not remain uh, on a, a product that is used by a small uh, base of, of clients. You know, uh, now there are thousands of uh, Kubernetes cluster everywhere. And um, so we are not only uh, learning from our own experience and a vendor experience, but, but for a much, from a much larger community. And uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, ecosystem uh, for me it, uh, brings much more value and uh, evolves faster than a traditional uh, closed source uh, product. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. There's one question I've, I've been meaning to ask since we recorded the last session. You know, as a financial institution, there's often uh, talks around that, oh, financial institutions are slow to adopt uh, new technologies and so on. And I know it's because you are in a regulated industry. How do you manage regulation with innovation? So um, as part of our internal uh, standards uh, for private cloud, 
we have a system of labels and this kind these labels the uh, each service uh, has the obligation to to meet the, these standards so we have a first level second level and third level and uh, for each level uh, you know that uh, your application can uh, meet the regulator requirements when the service has reached uh, the level. For example, if you have an application that is not very sensitive, not using uh, customer data, uh, and uh, that can uh, use uh, level one services, uh, then the, the application owners know that it can host uh, the application on services with the label uh, level one. For more advanced uh, information in terms of uh, sensitivity, then the application owner will look at services with level two, same for level three. This is uh, how it is organized. So behind these labels, there is a lot of work in terms of uh, uh, security of architecture, of operation and development standards that are uh, written and uh, audited. So uh, actually my team has spent the last uh, uh, three months just working to uh, reach a new level of label um, so that we can host uh, more and more sensitive application without uh, risking uh, security uh, and uh, uh, and also uh, security is a very large topic so uh, you know uh, it is about uh, availability about uh, uh, yeah. confidentiality and uh, uh, many other things okay yeah thank you yeah um we have a question here it says how do you how do you do multi-tenancy inside your platform to separate business applications at cluster and namespace level and why um, so we are relying um, on Kubernetes uh, mechanisms. Um, so basically, uh, we have the possibility to segregate uh, uh, the network traffic with network policy. We have a resource quota, limit range uh, to uh, guarantee the CPU and memory uh, for each application uh, inside uh, a multi-tenant environment. And also uh, with the, the Mariantis distribution, uh, we have a airbag uh, system that is built in based uh, on a, a, an LDAP directory. So each team of user is only able to access uh, its own namespace and the related objects and is not able to access someone else's application. So these are the, the main uh, uh, the main characteristics uh, of, of technical uh, architecture to meet that kind of challenge. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, one more question. How are you satisfied to collaborate with Mirantis <laughs> Kubernetes distribution? <laughs> so uh, we we are very satisfied. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, we are we have people from Mirantis uh, working with us uh, on a day to day basis. Uh, for us, it's as a a financial institution uh, it's part of uh, our uh, regular uh, requirements in terms of regulation to have support uh, from ex external expertise and uh, and so uh, when we are dealing with uh, uh, complicated uh, incidents uh, or where when we are doing some major upgrade for us it's a security to work uh, with uh, with my Rantis experts, and to know that also there, there are uh, there is a, uh, a development team behind uh, not only the community uh, with uh, no no uh, uh, contract, but really the a vendor that is providing its uh, services uh, to to help us uh, solve incidents. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I think that's all the questions we have from. Uh, the audience, it's been a very great interaction. Thank you very much for taking the time to join and answer the questions live. It's been an interesting session with all the questions. Thank you, you very much. Do you have to add before we end the session? 
Um, you mean, uh, do you have something to add? Yeah, if you have any. Anything else to add or say? Um, for just uh, can mention that uh, Société Générale is hiring uh, in different places uh, in the world. Uh, so do not hesitate to go to our career website to find position available. And maybe uh, you will join me uh, in your transformation journey. It will be interesting. And uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, interesting challenges in front of us. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> That's a very awesome closing. Yeah, so thank you very much, everyone uh, watching, and just I will be watching the recording later. Uh, once again, if you're an end user company and you would like to share your story, your cloud native uh, journey, uh, you can reach out to cncf at cncf.io slash end user, or if you want to be part of the end user community. Also remember that the KubeCon, Cloud Native Con EU 2021 happening in Valencia, next year may 17 to 20 the cfp is still open i think it's closing mid december so if you are interested in speaking there's still time to get your talk submitted and hopefully we see you all at valencia spin physically okay thank you very much hopefully. for joining us and bye-bye everyone bye-bye